Hi, and welcome back to the Autonomous and Electric Vehicles Summit here at FreightWaves. Hope you're enjoying the day. We have another exciting session for us today. We're going to talk about sometimes maybe the unglamorous part. Uh, I, I think it's still pretty glamorous, right? Because it is the infrastructure or uh, the, the what, what makes trucks really move. And we're going to be talking to Exos Trucks. Uh, Dakota Simler here, the co-founder and CEO of Exos, is joining us right now to talk about chassis and uh, and what that means for the electrification of, of delivery. Uh, welcome to uh, the, the conference today, Dakota. Thanks, Kevin. Appreciate you guys having me, and it's good to be speaking with you. Great. I, and can you introduce yourself and, and Exos and, and kind of give us your origin stories and, and what you're up to right now? Yeah, happy to. Uh, so Exos Trucks is a manufacturer of medium and heavy duty electric vehicles for the commercial vehicle segment. Uh, we're about five years old and I am the CEO and co-founder of the business. So prior to starting the business, I was actually a fleet operator myself and along with my co-founder. And we saw how challenging it was becoming to really operate diesel fleets. The new evolving re emissions regulations really led us to try and explore what other technologies were out there and how we could solve a lot of the pain points that we were experiencing as a commercial vehicle fleet. From the increased complexity of the mission systems on our DPFs and our SCR systems, to the increasing regulations that were changing every single year, to the increasing fuel cost of diesel at the time. And that prompted us to really understand how electric vehicles could help solve a lot of these challenges. Uh, and that really underpins everything we do at Exos. So we've been focused on the fleet segment for, for about five years now and really solving the challenges for fleet operators. And that's gotten us a, a tremendous amount of traction with commercial customers, fleets like UPS, FedEx, and others. And ultimately, uh, it's where we're focused on as we continue to grow. Today, we have vehicles on the road, operating with customers around the country, uh, delivering packages, moving cargo, moving freight. Um, and fleets are actually getting the opportunity not just to test these vehicles in a limited demonstration environment, but to operate them every single day so that they know how powerful electric vehicles can be for their operations and, and how they scale. And, and we're talking about light and medium duty trucks. We're talking about class five, class six, class seven, up into to class eight. One of your customers that, that uh, is Loomis, the armored truck service. And uh, can you kind of go into kind of that, I, I guess they are final mile, but um, both Loomis and, and UPS vans and, and kind of that final mile in the growth of e-commerce uh, a space and where you fit in with that. Absolutely. So I think we've all realized the trend and shifts in e-commerce by ordering all of our goods to our home now. And that was only accelerated by the pandemic. So what was a, a fast and rapid growing industry was exacerbated because everybody was getting their groceries delivered to their home, their consumer products, consumer supplies. Uh, and so the volume of shipments have gone up immensely and fleets like UPS and FedEx ground are all carrying that additional package volume. So the growth of those last mile delivery vehicles and parcel delivery vehicles has been immense. Um, you mentioned Loomis, which is another customer of ours. We like to think of them as, as more of a vocational customer, but they're really a unique customer in that they operate a pretty significant fleet here in North America, almost 4,000 vehicles, and they have challenges with idling. So if you think about a cash and transit application, these vehicles don't have any windows. So they have to keep their windows up operating anywhere from eight to 14, 16 hours a day idling while that vehicle is parked. So they might be doing anywhere from 10 to 30 stops a day, but for safety reasons and security reasons, because they're cargo, they're keeping that vehicle on at all times with the HVAC running and with all the other vehicle systems running. And that's really important because when you look at a lot of these cash and transit operators, they've been historically running diesels without diesel particulate filters and SCR systems. Those systems weren't designed to idle for hours on end. And so they were looking for solutions that could help meet their idling options and still keep the vehicles on, keep the driver cool and safe while they were picking up cargo. Uh, but ultimately they needed something that was gonna work. Some of these cash and transit fleets were pulling their trucks out of service weekly just to do their recharge cycles because the, the operating conditions of how much idling they were doing. So for, for Loomis, uh, we've really been able to solve one of their biggest maintenance headaches because our vehicles can sit there and idle for four, six, seven hours a day and ultimately not have any adverse implications to the maintenance schedule or the overall reliability of the vehicle. 
And that's that's been really prevalent outside of just cash and transit. There's a number of other vocational use cases where idling has has really started to hurt some of these vocational fleets. Yeah, idling is a, a true nemesis to to, to all fleets. Is well, let's talk about uh, how customers uh, accept delivery. I guess accept delivery, but you make the chassis and uh, you deliver those to the fleet or or the the auto body or the body builders, as they they say. Is that how the, the I guess distribution of uh, of what you manufacture and what you deliver, kind of the the lifespan of that. Yeah, so it really depends on the platform that we're building for a customer. Uh, on our strip chassis MDX platform, we're delivering a chassis to a final upfitter, in which case they'll install a body that may be a parcel delivery body, it might be an armored body, it might be a food delivery body. Um, it really depends on that customer spec. In the case of a chassis cab or a tractor application, we're delivering a full chassis with a cab. And then it'll go to that final upfitter to have a box installed or a vocational implement installed, it might be a refuse body or a utility body. Um, it really just depends on that customer spec. But we work very closely with those upfitters to ensure that the engineering integration is done and we're planning for all of the different interfaces, mounting systems, durability, warranty, and all of the electrical connections or power takeoffs that they need to, to operate on those body systems. From there, it gets delivered to a customer, um, and then we service and support it nationwide. So we've developed a network of, of partners. Uh, we started working with Dickinson Fleet Services, which is a nationwide network of independent mobile maintenance groups. Uh, and they have about 700 technicians nationwide that have already been supporting our vehicles on the road for several years now. Uh, and we've continued to roll out new distribution and service partners in different regions, such as in the Southeast, in Texas, uh, and a few other areas in the Southwest that'll also be supporting our vehicles in the field through a mobile maintenance fleet and parts and service. So keeping consignment parts inventory. And that's crucial really for a commercial fleet customer. This isn't a passenger car that you can park for a week or two while it's sitting in a shop. You need to have these vehicles back on the road same day or next day. And so having support partners that keep these vehicles up and, and the uptime high has been a big part of our strategy from day one so that fleet customers have the peace of mind when they buy the vehicle. And that's just sort of the, the, the support and service. I was going back and, and reading Alan Adler's uh, article. I, I think it was back in February whenever uh, an agreement was reached with Exos and, uh, and, and a SPAC partner. And, uh, you know, going public uh, through a SPAC. But, but part of that, uh, you know, there's a tidbit in the article about, uh, and I can't remember what as a service it was, but it mentioned um, Exos uh, offering that. Can you uh, talk a little bit about that, that service uh, service product or, or service system that you have? Absolutely. So we call it our Exosphere, which is our fleet as a service offering. And when we were fleet operators and ultimately a lot of the pain points that our customers experienced, we realized how complex it was to manage a fleet. Not only did you have to negotiate service and maintenance contracts with different dealers or service providers, you had to interface with a separate person for fueling or on-site fueling. You had to work with a different company or different vendor for telematics, fleet management, and fleet insight and analytics. And then ultimately go to a separate person for financing, vehicle financing. Um, so it became this very disaggregated system of suppliers. And in many cases, you needed multiple people to manage that work stream. So, what we've tried to do is help fleets make this transition to zero emissions vehicles. As they think about procuring electric vehicles, deploying the charging infrastructure, servicing and supporting those vehicles in the field, and then also monitoring and maintaining those vehicles through their telematics and over the air update platform, we've aggregated that into a single service for those customers. So they can pay a predictable fixed price base fee plus a utilization fee in order to get access to all those services so they don't have to become an expert at charging and infrastructure services. They don't have to become an expert at deploying different telematic systems across different vehicles, uh, in stocking consignment parts inventory in their different service centers. And that's really become an incredibly valuable tool. Uh, for some of the larger fleets, they have a lot of these capabilities in-house, but as you look at small and medium-sized businesses, anywhere from 10 trucks all the way up to a few thousand trucks, they're looking to the OEMs to help provide a lot of that support particularly in the early days as fleets begin to ramp up their electric vehicle purchases across the country. They want to know that they're going to have all of those support mechanisms in place, all of the infrastructure in place whenever they get a truck delivered. Um, so it's been a, a fast growing product for us and ultimately something that we see is 
becoming a bigger portion of our, our focus. Yeah, uh, sim simplifying the, the fleet management process, certainly music to the ears uh, of fleet managers and companies that operate, certainly private fleets out there. It's also music to the ears of investors. And if we go back to this back, um, I, I'm sure the, um, the, the the service part of, of your offering was music to their ears, right? Because we know investors love predictable recurring revenue. Uh, but on the, the, the spec, uh, you're, you're going through that process right now. What are the benefits of uh, of going public through a SPAC right now? It's been a popular thing over the last 12 months, uh, rather than going out and raising additional private capital or going the, the IPO route. Yeah, it's a great, great question. So we've started by, by raising private capital through strategic partners of ours, tier one suppliers and, and other folks in, in the private capital investors. When it came to looking at a SPAC transaction, uh, we really wanted to understand the, the full benefits before even going down that path. And what we realized is that when you look at the, the SPAC market, um, in order to become a public company, a lot of the regulations, a lot of the controls and the processes you need to implement and put into place, we were already doing as a private company. And so making those controls more robust and codifying them and establishing process for all of these things, something we were interested in doing, but it was also gave us the ability to continue to ramp our manufacturing footprint. So we have a, a unique manufacturing model that leverages the experience of existing contract manufacturers through a, a system we call flexible manufacturing or flex manufacturing. And as opposed to a traditional contract manufacturing where we just hand over the plans and the design and the engineering of our vehicles to a manufacturer, we're a lot more involved in the setup of that facility in the design layout the manufacturing execution systems, all of the automation design, and ultimately manage the quality within each of those facilities. But we look to our partners to provide the trained technical skill and the workforce that actually staffs that facility, as well as the shell of the facility itself. And what it allows us to do is actually downsize the facility to a much smaller footprint than a typical automotive plant to about 150,000 square feet. So we can deploy these rapidly in order to meet the growing customer demand in the commercial vehicle segment, uh, we can build a facility in under a year and actually start producing trucks there. And that really gives us a lot of flexibility to ramp demand and to meet the, the growing needs of fleet customers across the country. The other thing it does is allows us to use capital more efficiently in the early part of the business. <clears throat> While it's a much more capital efficient approach than sinking a half a billion or a billion dollars into an automotive plant, we feel that it also enables us by going through this SPAC transaction to be able to set up these facilities quickly and meet that growing demand. And so when it came to deciding as to whether we would merge with the SPAC, we were really focused on how we could continue to support customers, ramp our manufacturing footprint and ramp our support functions with distribution partners and parts distribution so that we were supporting all of these customers in the field around the country. Yeah, it's, it's really, uh, it's all about flexibility, especially in supply chains over the last uh, 12 to 15 months since the pandemic uh, coming out. Every, everyone's been stressed and uh, the new buzzword I think is, is coming out is anti-fragility. And it goes with flexibility and, and just in case, rather, maybe not rather than just in time, but uh, to, to, to think about flexibility and, and, and flexible manufacturing uh, certainly follows into that quite a bit. Uh, another positive thing about uh, going public and, and being a public company is building out the, the, the team to, to scale up. And being public, I, I think, helps with that. You, you have some great names already on your, on your team, if you want to describe them. And, um, and, and tell us a little bit about the, the benefits of, of being able to scale up and attract talent uh, as a public company. Yeah, it really is an incredibly valuable tool in the recruitment process and in building long-term value, not just for our shareholders, but also for all of our employees who now have the ability to participate in, you know, in uh, equity and, and the ability to have a, a stock that's going to continue to appreciate. But for us, as, as we look at hiring, we're about uh, 200 people now, almost 200 people, and it really gives us a much broader pool of talent to hire from. So we've ramped our team in accordance with building out a really experienced team that has done this before. So I'll start just by alluding to our CTO, uh, Rob Ferber. Rob is an early leader from Tesla. He was employee number three there and helped lay the early groundwork for their battery systems and some of their first vehicles like the Roadster and the Model S and has deep experience building lithium ion systems for the past couple decades 
uh, and a variety of other passenger car as well as commercial vehicle applications. So he really understands how to build a battery pack from, from the ground up or from the cell up, we like to say. Going beyond Rob, we've assembled another array of incredible technical leaders hiring from companies like Tesla, where there's an incredible focus on innovation and on building the most kind of scalable systems uh, in the manufacturing sag side with folks like our, our VP of manufacturing, Dag Reckhorn, as well as hiring folks from the traditional legacy manufacturers and the diesel truck manufacturers. Uh, Saleh Mirhaderi, who runs our, our software department, has really been incredibly important and valuable in building out our vehicle controls, all of our electrical architecture, high voltage and low voltage systems. And so as we've really built the team, we didn't try to reinvent the wheel for reinventing the wheel's sake. We tried to find the best leaders and the best engineering expertise and production expertise from existing companies and merge their skills and their talents so that we could build a scalable product platform that ultimately supported the needs of our customers. And we've been very fortunate to hire some great people up to this point, um, but going public will allow us to continue to expand that team uh, and to provide a, a compelling reason for, for joining Exos and our stability long-term uh, as new employees come into the fold. Thank you. Th thank you so much for your time today, Dakota. It's, it's been a pleasure talking to you. How does our audience reach out and learn more about Exos? Uh, you feel free to come to our website. We have a, a email there on our website as well as a contact form. Um, we're open and doing demos with customers all the time. Uh, and regularly scheduling demos for, for various fleets and, and also meeting with suppliers now. Um, it seems like we're on the tail end of the pandemic. So we've also been resuming some travel and, and actively engaging with various customers across the country and, and different partners of ours. So come to our website and, and reach out via, via the website channel. But appreciate the time today, Kevin, and, and thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Yeah, thanks to everyone for, for tuning in. It's been a great day here at the, uh, the Autonomous and Electric Vehicle Summit, and I uh, look forward to uh, catching the next session coming up right now.